Well, it's, it's, it's a huge pleasure to be standing here after, after a decade of seeing the DCO evolve and change and all of the fantastic science that's been done to that. And I would like to say a huge thank you uh, both to Bob Paisen and all of the other uh, key leaders who have led this process, but also the Secretariat who have done an, an amazing job of making these, making these meetings work uh, seamlessly and smoothly. And it's, it's, just, it's a pleasure to come to these meetings and meet friends, meet colleagues, and see absolutely fantastic science. Um, so, juice. Where would we be without juice? Um, to look at juice, we need good scientists. And I, and I particularly want to highlight um, uh, Annie Cheng, uh, she presented a poster uh, earlier in this uh, session, and can you hear me better? Uh, I'd like to uh, acknowledge Annie Cheng. I'll be talking uh, more about the work that she was presenting as a poster. Oliver War, um, he gave a, a, a really great talk, and of course, I've been working for a long, a, a long time now with um, Bar Barbara Show at Lola. But uh, I also want to really um, mention. Uh, the many other people that have been that have contributed to aspects of this work um, over the over the last over the last decade. Uh, oh, and of course, uh, juice. So this is uh, a particularly important juice. This is a juice that has got a, a Precambrian flavour. Um, it's a, a, a particular vintage, uh, probably a couple of gig years old, and that is what I'm going to be talking about. Um, these fluids come from the continental crust. The continental crust, for a long period of time, has largely been ignored, partly because of accessibility, partly because we just don't think it's that exciting. The continental crust is deep, inaccessible, reactions don't happen very fast there, and it is only in the last decade or so that we've really started to recognize the importance of the processes that are occurring in the continental crust and the impact those processes might have both on understa our understanding of life in deep environments, life at the extreme, uh, and also when you release those fluids, release those biota into shallow regions, the impact they may have on surface processes and a whole variety of, uh, of com components that, that are associated with that. So, the continental crust, it's four times the mass of the um, oceanic crust. Um, and we might think of the continental crust more like a tortoise. It is slow, things happen a little bit slowly, but it gets there, and what gets there is really important. Compared to the hair of the oceanic crust, the oceanic crust, you know, that's an exciting place to work. Things happen quick. There's a lot of biota and processes that we can make some really great scientific uh, discoveries uh, by, by looking at. But the continental crust isn't just a large mass, but it's a huge repository that has stored the reaction products for a long period of time. And sudden release of those reaction products, or even the slow release of those reaction products, can have a, an, an impact on near surface systems. So, and Bar Bar Barbara has very nicely uh, termed this the sleeping giant. And indeed it is. The, pre the, the uh, pre Precambrian continental crust has one more really important ingredient, and that's water. We have a largely mafic, uh, largely mafic environment. And this is a very nice graphic from, uh, for, for, from the USGS. This is, if we took all of the water on the planet and put it into a little sphere, this is what it would look like. Fresh surface water is almost inconsequential, but subsurface water can be split almost 50-50 between fresh underground water resources, essential for society, but an equal volume will be found as saline water within the Precambrian crust. And as soon as we have that water, we have the reaction of that water with the mafic environment, with serpentinization in particular. It doesn't occur very fast in the continental crust. In fact, it's very slow. But we have that mass leverage. We have that huge volume of continental crust to generate large amounts of methane over long periods of time. Because we're looking at long periods of time, there is another mechanism to generate hydrogen, and that's, hydro, uh, that, that's um, radiolysis. So 
the natural concentrations of uranium and thorium in the continental crust will generate ionizing radiation. And through excitation and ionization, we will generate hydrogen as products of that process. And because ionization, uh, ionizing radiation, helium uh, as, as alpha particles is part of that process, we have a natural relationship then between helium and hydrogen produced through that process. And we can look at the total system when we, when, when we go down underground, and we can see the products of the water rock interaction and the radiolysis in our fluid systems. We have highly saline fracture fluids, for example. We've seen many pictures of, of the uh, underground environment. These are all very rich in the hydrogen that is generated over these long periods of time, accompanied by significant quantities of helium. Some of these mine gases contain up to 30% by volume helium, with the rest of the gas being made up with hydrogen, nitrogen, and methane formed from uh, abiogenic reactions, Fischer trope synthesis, uh, uh, bringing all of these components together. We have a very complex mixture of gases which control the ability of those environments to host life and to con uh, control and contain the uh, chemical reactions of mig any migrating fluids. Most importantly, these fluids are, in terms of mass, as important as the fast reactions that are, are occurring at the mid-ocean ridges. When you sum the total reaction rate of methane, uh, or rather of hydrogen being generated within the continental crust, uh, the radiolysis and the hydration of the Precambrian continental crust is the same at the same level uh, as the generation of hydrogen at mid-ocean ridges. And about 30% of that production is in fact by, by radiolysis. So what we really do have with helium is, is a mechanism to track where these fluids are, going, are, are coming from. And let's see if I can, I'm a slide, slide shy. So in terms of mass balance, the, the, uh, the, the, the methane, the hydrogen generated is uh, uh, critical, and we can use helium in particular to trace uh, these, these processes and reaction mechanisms. Um, we've already heard a lot about the, uh, from, from Barbara and Oliver, of the mine fluids, and in particular from Kid Creek, uh, there's also data from Sudbury. This is uh, some very nice work that Oliver Waugh has produced. Certainly in 2013, we were, we were showing that the noble gas accumulation ages, so that is just the raw amount of time it takes to generate the amount of helium-4, the amount of argon-40, the amount of xenon produced by the fission of uh, uranium. The in-situ ages we're looking at, uh, we're, we're about 1.2 giga years. Resampling those at a deeper level, we're, we're finding in situ accumulation ages of about 2, point, uh, about, uh, two giga, giga years in age. When we go back to some of those uh, more, more shallow uh, samples, um, we find now that they're younged, suggesting that those, those fluids that we originally sampled, those pristine fluids um, exposed by the mining activity at the time, have mixed with slightly younger fluids, starting to give us an insight into how that fluid regime is connected, and certainly in the case of mining activity, how it responds to a changing stress, stress regime within that system. Uh, we've also uh, looked at and extended the, 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 the study. We've got um, samples from the, the Sudbury impact crater, uh, mines down to 1.7 kilometers depth, separate mine down to 1.4 kilometers depth. Again, these mines are showing that the fluids in these environments are incredibly old. This, was really, quite, this really was quite a surprise to find, and find that these fluids are not uh, recharged, they're not flushed, they're not pushed out. These are just sitting there accumulating all of the reaction products over a long period of time.
So we're generating conceptual ideas of how these are stored, the environment in which they're stored in, how they respond, certainly on anthropogenic timescales, to, to, to mining activities. If we have systems of fractures containing these fluids, older ones tend to be more deeper than, 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 uh, than, than uh, younger samples, younger, younger fractures. If we sample and through boreholes the fluids and then the mine r relaxes, we see more fractures, we see mixing, we explain the younging of those fluids. Whereas the pristine samples exposed by the active, uh, active mine workings are giving us the old, and, and, uh, old pristine samples. But this generates um, a really interesting, it's not a problem, this is, this, this is um, a conceptual view of what these fluids are doing. These fluids are being generated, they are being stored on huge geological timescales, planetary scale, uh, pla planetary timescales. But what impact do these fluids that are generating and operating in the deep crust have on near surface environments? How do they release, how do they, uh, how, how do they um, get out of the deep crust? What's the mechanism there of their release? What is their rate of release? What amount is released? And what reaches the near surface? Hydrogen is quite reactive. Methane is quite reactive. There's potential for chemi chemical reactions and biological reactions, removing those en route to the near surface. When it reaches the near surface, what impact does it have on the surface systems? Are there volumes and masses that can impact the, the atmosphere? Maybe not so important for Earth, but, but on other planets, when you're considering release of deep gases, the masses that can be released could impact uh, thin atmospheres. When you are removing the fluids from the, the, uh, the deep environment, what impact does that have on the deep biosphere if indeed we're looking at environments which are hosting microbial activity? And uh, back, back, back on Earth, we are interested in resources. There are potential uses of finding clean energy. Can we find hydrogen within the deep subsurface? Can we find helium within the deep subsurface that society can use? So spin-outs from uh, the DCO activities it is not just carbon, but all of these tools and techniques that we're using to follow the carbon, uh, in their own right, we're making, uh, making significant uh, advances in our understanding of where the hydrogen exists, where the helium exists, and how we might exploit that new understanding of those systems. And I'll be using pretty much uh, noble gases, mainly helium, to just illustrate some of these, some of these processes. So helium, as I've said, it's fundamentally related to hydrogen generation through radiolysis. Helium within the mine studies, we can look at the relationship between helium and the hydrocarbons, helium and the methane, helium and the nitrogen, helium and the hydrogen. And dependent on the tectonic environment that we're looking at, we can use the surface expression of helium to start to understand the mechanisms that are responsible for releasing the deep fluids and bringing those deep fluids to the surface. For example, this is a, a, just a schematic of a rifting system, and we might need to consider, for example, the role of the, the, the mechanism of gas release from the minerals to the mineral interfaces, from the mineral interfaces to the fractures, from the fractures to the near surface, and the role of the other fluids in the environment in potentially providing vectors to bring those deep fluids to the surface. We clearly see the role of substantial and punctuated release um, of deep fluids um, in many environments. 
we can see, uh, this is a very nice study from um, Jacob Lowenstern from the USGS, published in Nature a, a few years ago. Uh, the plume underneath Yellowstone is clearly putting a huge thermal pulse into the stable continental crust, and it is mobilizing and releasing a vast amount of helium. It's one of the largest helium fluxes measured at the, at, at the Earth's surface. And every million years, just the Yellowstone spot itself is releasing, excuse the, uh, the, um, the units, 13 billion cubic feet of, of helium. 13 billion cubic feet, to give you um, some context, um, our, our, our society uses about 6 billion cubic feet of helium uh, per year, and that is being degassed just at the Yellowstone, uh, Yellowstone hotspot. Once it's into the atmosphere, it's lost to space, and we can no longer use that, obviously. Um, we see the role of the tectonic environment in releasing those deep fluids in uh, other rifting systems. This is a study you know, a little while ago by uh, Beinlich et al. in 1999, looking at the, the Eggergraben, so an offshoot from the, from the Rheingraben in the Czech Republic. And here we see a, a volcanic center with a large amount of carbon dioxide being degassed. And then as we move away from that thermal aureole, we see a transfer from carbon dioxide, magmatic gases, and at the edge of that aureole, we see nitrogen and helium being released. Um, and that is, that is the deep fluid uh, that we have access to at the surface. These are potentially uh, exciting areas to study not just the flux of helium in the center, but the nature and character of the deep fluids that are reaching the surface, and from those, not be completely reliant on the, on the mines and deep boreholes, but we have access to some deep fluids and their surface expression through some of these, these environments, which we haven't really exploited yet. And if you want to bring all of those together, uh, Clearly, where you're going to release the largest amount of deep fluids is where you have fresh activity, fresh rifting, fresh volcanism. And this is looking at the uh, Rukwa uh, section of the uh, Tanzanian East African Rift. Invariably, you will find deep carbon observatory scientists. Uh, and I think Pete has found, Pete Barry has found some uh, exciting gas. And that gas is, the gas bubbling out here is almost pure helium. This is, this is a 10% uh, helium, 90% nitrogen bubbling out of these springs exactly where you'd predict it from, from, from that thermal, uh, thermal pulse uh, concept. But it's not just the exciting places. It's not just where the volcanic activity is taking place. We know that the deep gases are slowly leaking out of the continental crust all of the time. I'm going to just move forward. We can see helium in the fellow Scandian shield. We see helium in many other environments. I just want to very quickly show you some modeling work that Annie Chen, Cheng has been doing, looking at helium escaping through the fairly stable intracontinental basins, and this is the Williston Basin in Canada. We can derive the helium concentration in gas samples. We can extrapolate the gas samples and calculate the helium concentration in the groundwater. Several of these samples demand that we have a helium flux into the system. The helium concentrations are older than the amount you can generate in situ. Several of the samples are lower than the, the, than, than the in situ rate, suggesting that there's been flushing of that process. We can generate a simple one-dimensional model, solving the transport equations, in this case for uh, diffusion. We can build up the helium profile for each um, of the different lithologies, stack those lithologies up on each, up, up on each other, taking into account porosity change, taking into account diffusion coefficient changes with temperature, and we can, we can see the helium concentration grow in the groundwater as those lithologies are stacked onto each other. They will reach steady state and stop. They will stick on another aquitard, move to steady state again, move to steady state again. Any second now, we're, we're going to put on the Colorado shale, and you see 
this rapidly puts a lid on the system and increases the helium content to the base of that aquifer system. Take into account flushing of shallow aquifers, and we have a very good match with a really simple model for understanding uh, deep fluid release into shallow sedimentary systems. This modeling approach gives us a, a, a really good sense of the flux of helium entering the base of these systems. And we understand from that the impact of helium interpretation in term, uh, if, if we want to date those groundwater systems. And very simply, to summarize, we know that the volumes of fluids in the deep continental crust evolve over time. Large amounts are kept down there, but we see material that is accumulated, released, and it's not just the exciting places where, we, where that release occurs. I've shown you the helium flux. I'm going to show you one more slide. If we couple the nitrogen with that helium flux, in that same helium profile, we can look at the nitrogen profile, and what we find as soon as you incorporate nitrogen into these models is that the nitrogen concentration exceeds the solubility for the groundwater system. As soon as you exceed the solubility for the groundwater system, you generate a free gas phase. The helium is insoluble. It goes into the free gas phase, and we generate a nitrogen-helium free gas phase, which forms a future resource for helium exploration. And this particular work is giving us a new helium exploration play concept. If we need to find helium, we don't need to just go to where it's exciting. Go to some of these slow places. Go to some of these places that have been accumulating deep crustal fluids for hundreds of millions of years. And that is, what we will, that is where we will find, in this case, helium. And it is just one of many of the collaterals that the Deep Carbon Observatory has allowed us to develop with the science that we've, that we've been doing. Now, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a couple of questions. If there are no questions, then thank you very much. And thanks to all speakers from this morning.